Last season, we were uh, inconsistent overall. We were winning games, but we weren't always playing to our standard. This veteran group now has learned that last year, maybe our focus wasn't always where it needed to be, and uh, some of the disease of me started to creep in a little bit. 13 seasons of professional football can go by in a flash, and I was grateful for every second of it. This game gave me everything, not without taking a few pieces of me along with it. Playing offensive line, it's been one of the most rewarding and fulfilling experiences of my life. Now, thanks to Audible, I look forward to sharing insights and stories with you of our favorite NFL stars, and of course, the fraternity of athletes that protect them. Offensive linemen are eternally bonded, and I am proud to forever be a part of the Blocking Brotherhood. I'm Ryan Khalil, and this is Block Forever. Well, they didn't cancel us after one episode, so we must be doing something right. My name's Ryan Khalil, and I call this show Block Forever because I'm an offensive lineman. I've always been an offensive lineman. I forever will be an offensive lineman. Those that have played on the O-line understand how special this fraternity is. I once heard a coach scold a player for not blocking long enough in a pass protection. The player said he held on to the ball forever. And the coach rebuttaled with, it doesn't matter how long he holds on to the ball. There is no clock in your mind. You just block forever. And that's always stuck with me. And it's something most players, it's something only offensive linemen can truly appreciate and understand. That's why I call this show Block Forever. Forever bonded in the fraternity of offensive linemen. And also sometimes it feels like you just block forever. Today's show, we have two great guests. First up, Buffalo Bills head coach Sean McDermott. He was a coordinator when I was in Carolina. Somebody who, along with another former Panther, general manager Brandon Bean, has completely turned this Bills franchise around. And I'm excited to really get into their headspace on how they were able to do that. And later in the show, a guy who has seemingly been blocking forever, all-pro guard Joe Batonio, whose Browns take on the Steelers this Thursday night only on Amazon Prime Video. And something that pulls all my heartstrings is Joel's really interesting backstory. We got into the unbelievable conversation about his father, who was a backyard bare-knuckle fighter and a guy who Joel credits with teaching him many, many things that helped him get into the NFL, including a term I've never heard of, bone manipulation. Before we get to the interviews, though, something that's come up a few times this last week is a question about Super Bowl hangovers. And so watching the two Super Bowl teams from last year, and I played on a team 2015 season. We went to Super Bowl 50, we went 15-1, and and obviously lost to the Broncos. In the following season... We went 6-10, and ten, so obviously a disappointing season, to say the least. And I still think we play them nine times out of ten, we beat them. But they had our number that day, and they played great. We didn't. And we made a lot of changes in the offseason, changes that I didn't always agree with, a lot of players didn't agree with. Josh Norman was a big part of the defense. I felt we let him go. But when you do have a great team, when you do have a great season – when you can make a long run in the playoffs, when you can get to a Super Bowl, and if you can win a Super Bowl, it's not always obvious what aspects of the team were the backbone to that success. I feel very strongly about a great job Rivera did in balancing the roster with young, fresh, incredibly talented players led by and mentored by legacy guys who were right there on the end but came in and did such an incredible job helping build a culture of accountability and work ethic and, you know, even swag to a certain point. But we didn't do the same thing the year after. We let a lot of those older guys go. And I can't tell you enough how invaluable that is to have, especially when a big part of the game 
is controlling your emotions, controlling your emotions within the locker room, controlling your emotions from the external pressures of family and friends and media. Veteran guys and really great veteran guys do a good job in helping keep the team steady eddy, keep them balanced, keep them right down the middle, not get too high, not get too low. For us, I felt more like it was the changes we made and not recognizing what made us great that year and not trying to find a way to recapture that. But it's always easy to say in hindsight. And now on to the interviews. My time in Carolina, I've got to know a lot of really great coaches. Sean McDermott is one of the top in his sincerity and his work ethic and obviously in his talents. He's somebody that I got to know very well in Carolina, mostly in the down times that we had as a team, but he's a quiet, head down, blue collar, working coach. And I took for granted my time with him to not really sit down and pick his brain on his philosophies, on how he approaches the game. I knew he would be a head coach one day. And when he went to Buffalo, Anyone I knew on that team that I talked to, I made sure to reach out and make sure that they knew what kind of man and leader they were getting in Buffalo, and he has not disappointed. I'm excited now to take advantage of this opportunity to ask the questions I should have asked when I sat down with him all those years ago in Carolina, and excited to share our conversation with you. Now that you're a head coach, what the hell do you do? <laughs> what is your job? That's a great question. I'm Besides still setting team that, meetings uh, and yeah. practice schedules. <clears throat> in year six, going into year six now, I don't know that I've got it all figured out. Like what exactly, if you said, hey, write the job description for a head coach. I, I, I couldn't put it all out there because it's just tell me the day, tell me the situation, and you've got to be ready to be flexible. I think in part the job is sports psychologist or maybe just psychologist overall for life. Right. Right whether that's players or staff or myself. I think part of it is event planner, as you said, um, team schedules, uh, practice schedule, just building alignment in terms of philosophical alignment on what we're trying to do, how we're trying to get it done. And then part of it is problem solver, right? Every day there's problems that come up, real life problems or problems in our building with that relate to football and, and uh, try and do our best to solve them. Speaking of which, and this is something I think is crazy that you guys have to navigate because it's not only just your own philosophies about it, but also there's rules with the PA and the league and how you guys can structure this, which is practice. I've always been fascinated by different philosophies on practice load, you know, practicing in the environment versus not, rest, recovery, how you work certain age groups in your roster. I I'm curious what your thoughts are. Um, I know we had some of our own philosophies in Carolina, but what, what has changed for you or has been the same? You know, the rules are, to some extent, um, they get in the way, you know, of what I feel like you really... If you're really trying to get a player where he really um, can go, I feel like some of the rules that we now have get in the way, but rules are, are put in place for a reason, right? And so we we navigate those rules and adjust. Some of them uh, are shitty reasons. Overall, though. well, you can say that I can't. So. <laughs> overall, I do, I do think rest, sleep is important, rest is important. I know I'm in a better spot. I've, I'm a, uh, I like to think I'm a hard worker, mm -hmm. um, but I feel like if I get proper rest, I'm thinking more clearly. I'm sure a player the same way, and their muscles are, you know, ready to be trained and everything. But I, I, we're, I'm a big believer, and we as a staff are big believers in practice and and how important shaping a good practice is. I know John Wooden's credited for that, and I believe in that. I think a lot of coaches go out there and. Well, we've always done it just this way, so we're always gonna just do that. Very cookie cutter type approach. Being very purposeful and intentional about how we practice, how long we practice is key. Uh, we are also big believers in the GPS and the science behind it um, and the load. And um, I think it's one part of the equation, not the 
answer, but it's one part of what we do. And what about callus? Do you think there's a lack of callus that gets built by not having that same kind of intensity yeah. we used to have? Yeah. I mean, you remember we'd, we'd start two a days and, and I remember I was in Philadelphia when it was like that and Coach Reed would have first three days of training camp, right? Six practices in a row, right. followed by the seventh, the fourth morning, all in pads. And if you made it through that, not only just a player, but a coach, right? Yeah. It was long. That 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 kind of start to build that built that callus for you as a team, and I think that is important somewhere in there. You've got to get that somewhere. You knowing one day I want to be a head coach. Were there things that you always kept in the back of your mind where you said, "I'm going to emulate this exact thing I learned. I think this was so effective, and this is exactly what you need to do." And then on the flip side of that, were there things that you were like, I, "If I ever become a head coach, this is never <laughs> I'm gonna, not this doing is that. never going to happen." <laughs> I mean, I remember in Carolina with Coach Rivera, he came to me one day and he said, hey, you know, presentation, how you, how you present something in the meeting is important. I'm shaking my head yes, of course, but in my mind I'm going, I don't believe that. Can't we just walk in there, tell them the facts, tell them the truth? And he was right. I mean, going in there and selling the message, the way you position the message, help sell the message, and, and, uh, and that was important. And it's important to to be able to go in there and do that and do it the right way. And and, and, uh, and so I, that was one of the many things I learned from Ron along our journey together, but also now as a head coach. When you have to give bad news, like do you try to uh, remove yourself from that situation or how do you, yeah. or do you take it head on? Head on. I mean, that's, uh, that's one of the hardest parts of the job. The cultures that I've been around, when when everyone, let's say, is afraid to be the bad guy, that doesn't, over the course of time, it may be feel good right now, but over the course of time, we're, we're living a lie, and, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to crumble the culture. So Brandon and I both take that job head on and, and that responsibility because uh, that's a necessary part of the job. The love part, yes, but also the truth part. I remember when we were in Carolina, Coach Rivera would come in meetings and he would talk about some bullshit call that happened the week before or something. And he would say, I was on the phone with the league. Uh, we were talking about this or that. I never really got like a straight answer on like where those things landed other than for him to tell us he was complaining on our behalf. How often do you talk with the league about calls that happened the <laughs> week before? Yeah. Probably not as much as Coach did back then, <laughs> um, because quite honestly, this goes back to the earlier question of like things that probably wouldn't do when when you're watching. Um, it's just it's just not something that I want to spend my time on. Sure. Um, yes, I want to I want to back my team, and I know Ron Ron's very involved with the league in that regard too, and so he's been an ambassador in in, in yeah, that yeah. area. Uh, having said that. The call is not going to change. I'll make sure we educate ourselves on what we can do differently. But for me, it's more of, hey, just tell me how I need to coach it, and uh, and we'll get it communicated. How much do you hate talking with the media every day <laughs> and navigating that whirlwind of stuff? You know, I think uh, I was around Andy Reid. Andy Reid always had a good way. He always protected the team. Um, he always took, put it on his shoulders. And I think as we're talking about winning, he showed me the way. And um, whether it's Coach Reed, Coach Belichick, who has his similar but different approach. And um, I think that's the way to go about it. Uh, I think Coach Harbaugh in, in Baltimore does a great job of it as well. And, but, the, but the media has changed overall. And, and fortunately, we have more media members. Unfortunately, um, the more and more you share sometimes, the more and more you know, potential obstacles you create for your team. Sure. So, uh, I just wish that dynamic maybe were, were a little bit different. In the game planning aspect of it, especially on the defensive side, how involved are you? I mean, obviously probably not as much as when you were just a coordinator. Yeah, I mean, that's fluctuated. The first year I think I came in, the head coaching job was so expansive that I was not as involved. And I also wanted to give staff, the staff the, the room that they needed to, to be themselves and see how it went. And then since that point in time, uh, in particular, last season, uh, more involved. And, and now this year, my goal is to not be as involved um, because of some of the work and conversations we had over the off season. But I just, I can already tell that I'm going to have a hard time pulling back far enough to, to do that. Do you find yourself spending more energy than you probably want to on media and social media and managing the psychology of your team around that stuff? Yeah, absolutely. We talk a lot about, about those areas of managing your life outside of the building, managing your life in between football, 
We have a development team of four or five staff members so we can meet the players exactly where they are, whether it's religiously, um, psychologically, and then um, just people that care for them. It's like a circle of care, if you will, of, yeah. so that, uh, and it's very confidential. So if a player is feeling a certain type of way, good or bad, they can seek out a staff member in that development team, and whether it's just sharing, venting, or, or get, get important help. For me, when I first came in the league, I remember coming into a locker room, and I remember watching guys play cards on boxes <laughs> and mess around and nap and study. And, and then at the end of my career, I came into that same locker room, and I saw every player facing their locker on their cell phone. It was, it was kind of sad and disheartening to watch. I'm curious how much of that you've seen, how much the football locker room player landscape has changed and how you've evolved around that. That's been an adjustment for me because like you, I was around the NFL when it wasn't like that. And now it is like that. And sometimes I'll walk into our cafeteria and see players, six, seven players at the same round table, all looking down at their phones. And I'll you know, joke around and say, hey, how's the conversation going? Because that is a part of uh, a team, right, is knowing each other and bonding through those moments in between meetings and games and whatnot. But the landscape has changed a ton uh, in that regard. And I've just learned to evolve and em embrace it a little bit and try and <clears throat> try and get into their world a little bit more. What have you found is been your best way of managing expectations for your guys? It's really nothing new for us. Yes, it's exciting for the fans. There's a sense a little bit of it's satisfying because of where things were when, when we arrived here a few years ago. But also, I believe this is true in life too, Ryan, and, and I think you personify this. Like if you've always done things a certain way to a certain standard, just because there's new expectations or high expectations doesn't then mean that you need to adjust what you're all of a sudden doing. It's, it's we've always done it a certain way, so keep doing it that way and don't let outside expectations drive internally what we're trying to get done. But I feel like certain individuals handle that better than others. Guys that we were with in Carolina were mm -hmm. really great at that. And it felt like the more of those guys you had around, the easier it was to sort of influence the rest of the group. Yeah, well, I think that's where you have to have a core group of veteran leaders um, on the team in all three phases of the ball to help spread that message, share uh, hey, this is how we do things here and, and educate the younger players cause, because it can't all come from the GM or the head coach. And, and I think when you have that, it offers you an, an advantage to, to connect with the entire team at every corner, not just the players that start, mm -hmm. but also the, the players that are going to contribute in certain roles on the team. Do you meet with those veteran guys a lot and talk about that? We do. We meet uh, as a captain group. Um, so we last year had eight captains, and so we'll meet as a captain group. Um, and then beyond that, I have my guys that are the connectors in, in addition to the captain group, mm -hmm. the guys that really influence the team, but they're not captains, unfortunately, right. but they really carry influence on our football team. Our veteran leadership group this year really grew from the experience of last season. I mean, last season we were uh, inconsistent overall. Mm -hmm. We were winning games, but we weren't always playing uh, to our standard. And I think going through the ebbs and flows of a season, our players learned that this veteran group now has learned that last year, maybe our focus wasn't always where it needed to be. And uh, some of the disease of me started to creep in a little bit. You and I are aligned with me guys and guys who put themselves before the team. We had guys like that in Carolina, which I won't name, but neither you or I were in, in positions to make those calls. Have you had a situation where you've had a guy that has been on the bubble because you're like, he's not culturally what we want, but he can really play that position well? Yeah. At the end of the day, one of the things I've learned is – whether it was in Carolina or here, like 2017, um, expectations were very low. People did not expect us to make the playoffs mm -hmm. with the roster that we had. And that team goes and makes the playoffs for the first time in this organization's history of 16, 17 years. And that was a great teacher to me of like, you can do it with, uh, respectfully I say this, you can do it with less mm -hmm. as long as the, the people work together, right? And they come together for a common goal and a common purpose. And that to me, as well as our Super Bowl year in Carolina, where 
Um, it was just a very unselfish approach. I felt like all season long. I think you were, I'm reminded all the time of how important that is. Yeah, there's no disrespect on the on the doing with less because players overcome coaching. Also, <laughs> we, we've had some uh, questionable coaches on staffs yeah. before. What about when you have a young guy at your franchise spot, and now people are talking about him being an MVP? How do you manage that? Well, you know, I believe we got off to the right start when Josh came in here, and his DNA. His support system is outstanding, and his DNA allows for this growth mindset of, hey, I've got to get better. I've got to do my job to help this team, yes, on the field, but also off the field. Josh wasn't a player that came in, or a person, rather, that came in and said, um, I need to have all these commercials and do all this stuff off the field for my brand, or he fully understood he, he had to get it done on the field first. And that's what leads to some of these opportunities that he has now off the field. Having said that, I feel strongly that he is very focused on what goes on with this team and what goes on in the field and how that is more important in terms of his goals that he has for himself than the other stuff. The show's called Block Forever. I wanted to have a show that was a love letter to football through the lens of an offense alignment. I'm curious your thoughts on offense alignment. I know it's kind of a cliche. Everybody says it. you need a great offense line, but I firmly believe it when you say it. So I, I just would love your sort of, you know, 30,000 foot view of offense line play and in particular your O-line. I think a lot of the, as you know, a lot of the other positions get shown on ESPN or the, or the, or the credit, right? But if you don't have a good offensive line, you're gonna have a hard time winning. I mean, you look at around the league, you look at in college, who wins? It's a direct result to me of offensive line play and defensive line play. And I'm fascinated by offensive line play. I think there's a lot of carryover to other positions, really. Like, ironically enough, playing corner, playing DB, there's a lot of offensive line uh, movements that are similar. Uh, to good corner play, but I like going into the meeting rooms when I get a chance to go into the meeting rooms and learning um, from Coach Cromer and, and our offensive line coaches. And I like being around that group because they're unique in what they're asked to do and then also who they are uh, amongst NFL teams. I mean, they're, they're just different guys and uh, they have a, just a different way. It's almost like a fraternity, a small fraternity inside each building around the NFL That is that is pretty cool. You can listen to Block Forever and other sports content on Audible. Audible is the home of storytelling, audiobooks, originals, podcasts, and more. Start listening free at audible.com. Professional football was never in the plans for Joel Batonio, even in college. This is something that I can personally relate to. But he's now in his ninth year with the Cleveland Browns. He's also one of the nicest guys in the sport. I've gotten to see that. Everybody I've talked to that's played with him says it, but just an absolute animal when he plays the game. I've always loved watching him and was really excited that I got to sit down and talk with him. Hope you enjoy our conversation. Joel, I appreciate you jumping on, man. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. It's no secret you signed a huge deal and well-deserved. I got to imagine now you'll be staying in Cleveland your entire career, but I'm curious how important was it for you to show loyalty towards the organization that took a chance on you and be part of a team that's trying to build a winning culture, or was this just more of a business decision? Yeah, for me, they showed so much faith in me drafting me, and I was banged up early in my career. So when I got into contract negotiations, I thought it was good faith of me to come back here and help try and change the future of the franchise. Um, and since I've been here, there's always that thought in my mind that we're one game away, one season away, and we're getting closer and closer. And so for me, the choice was pretty easy. You know, my family loved it here. The people treated us well. And um, I was like, I want to be part of this turnaround. I want to be part of it when we win games and hopefully compete for Super Bowls. Every player is different. I'm curious, were you always a guy who dreamed of playing in the NFL or were you a lot like me where the idea of playing professional sports for a living never crossed your mind growing up? Um, I didn't love football when I first started playing it. You know, seventh, eighth grade. I didn't know what I was doing and I was getting beat up. I'm like, this isn't that fun, you know. I love playing basketball. You could score and do all that stuff. 
Um, and then once I realized, like, hey, basketball's kind of helped me on the f- on the football field. I started, you know, loving football a little bit more. I always told myself as a kid I wanted to play like college sports, but I wasn't very heavily recruited. I got a Nevada offer pretty late in the um, process, and at that time it was just like I want to be a starter here eventually. And it took me um, about two years, but then once I got there, it's like I want to be an All Conference player. And so it was just like these small goals that helped me um, become the player I am, and it worked out great. Speaking of things that have helped you, I've read a lot about your pops, Mike Batonio. He sounded like an amazing man. I know he's passed, but I was hoping you could tell me a little bit about him and and what kind of relationship the two of you had. Yeah, he was uh, always my role model growing up. And as a little kid, I didn't realize like he was a bare knuckle fighter, you know. I just was like, oh, he's my pops, and he goes, does karate sometimes, and no big deal. And then it moved into this, like, MMA, you know, wrestling and and hand-to-hand combat. And and I remember just going to people's backyards, and there would be rinks, and um, they'd get in there and spar. But he did go to the World Combat Championship once. But it was before, like, UFC started and stuff like that. They didn't have any rules. It was, like, no eye gouging nothing below the waist you know and um he fought against bart bell who was a stud you know back in the day and it was like no weight classes so my dad was like 50 pounds lighter so i watched this fight on youtube and it's one of the most incredible brutal fights i've ever seen your dad is 6'1 215 the other guy's fighting is 6'3 265 so i'm imagining like a db fighting a linebacker and I mean, the amount of grit your pop shows in putting up this incredible fight. Eventually, obviously, he gets overpowered by this guy. I'm sure you've watched this fight from time to time. I'm curious, what did you take from that fight watching it? Honestly, just never giving up because he got in a tough position to start, but he actually, like, at one point flipped it over and um, was in a strong position, but then he kind of slipped and got choked. But... um it was just never given up and like he could have tapped mm-hmm. you know five minutes earlier but he was just like i'm gonna fight i'm here for my family i know you were really young at the time but do you have any memories or recollections about this whole after, thing after the fight we went to disneyland and he was kind of beat up bruises on his face and everything and some guy came up to him and was like hey can i get your autograph and i was like is my dad famous or something? And this whole experience and having a dad with this kind of toughness and perseverance, how did it help shape you when you were growing up? For me, it was the consummate hard work. And that I think that was just the definition. He was like, whatever you want to do in life, just do your best and work your hardest at it. And he would always tell me, he's like, if you want to be a plumber, you want to clean toilets, like just be the best you can be. And that was always my mindset. And honestly, when I was a kid, it was like, I have to work hard so I don't let him down. And then it kind of just built into the person who I was. I've never done MMA, but I got to imagine there is some crossover between MMA and football because playing offensive line is literally like you're in many combat fights every single play. Were there any techniques or things that you took from your dad's fighting style that you were able to implement in your own game? He was very good with his hands and like he called it like bone manipulation or something like that. And um, a lot of it. Wait, is, what does that mean? He would. I don't even know how to do it, but he put my like fingers and hands and joints and locks and like you're tapping out like instantly. <laughs> so I don't really use that in football, but the leverage and just like knowing someone's body movement and positioning, like I think really helps you. What about like at the bottom of a pile with a guy like you really hate? Are you grabbing like some wrists <laughs> or something like that? Uh, you, you know, we don't talk about what goes on at <laughs> the bottom of the pile. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. When I've told people that I was going to interview you, one of the things I kept hearing back was you're one of the nicest guys they've ever been around. But that's not what I see when I watch you play. Can you talk a little bit about you personally, but just offensive line in general and how different of a mindset it is? You know, there's a controlled aggression to the game that I don't think people, it's hard to articulate really unless you actually play the position. Yeah, I think for me, um, it really is a mindset change. Because off the field, I, you know, I'm just a nice guy and I enjoy people and stuff. I have two little kids at home. So uh, it's such a different mindset. 
and then I get into the game, and you have to protect your guys. You have to play to the whistle. You have to finish blocks. So I just do my job and play as hard as I can, and then I come off the field, and I'm just my normal self. Have you ever extended it too far, though, where you get so angry or out of control that it sort of it messes up your technique or the, the intention of the play? Yeah, there's a few times where you get overly aggressive. Um, I think it happens a little bit where you're like, I'm going to crush this guy off the line of scrimmage and they got a quick inside move. I think that's knowing your guy you're going against, too, you know. And so for me, it's really channeling that, you know, and just being like, all right, I know my assignment. Do I have help here? And just understanding what the play calls for. When you were drafted back in 2014, you found yourself on a line slotted between two potential Hall of Famers and Joe Thomas and Alex Mack. What was that like? Yeah, it was uh, pretty surreal for me, honestly. You know, you don't know much about Cleveland. You come from California, and then you get, get lined up, and it's like Joe Thomas to your left, Alex Mack to your right. My whole mindset really was just like, don't mess it up for them. I think that helped me, though. They just told me what to do, and I just ran and, and uh, played as hard as I could my first year. But then you learn their study habits, what they do during the week. And um, all that stuff just grows with you. And um, that's kind of what I, I learned and stepped into. What have, what have you learned from those two guys that you take with you, either that has been a big part of your DNA and, and how you approach the game or how you also pay it forward to younger guys? Yeah, I think as far as Alex Mack goes, I mean, his finish on every play, he reminded me of like a dog chasing a tennis ball. Like anytime the ball is thrown, he just runs after it and, and his work ethic and his finish. And I'm like, I want to establish that into my game. And then um, Joe Thomas was just so technically sound all the time and the way he understood his rusher and who's he going against and just trying to take those detailed notes during the week so you can perform on Sundays. I couldn't agree more about Alex. It takes a lot of stamina to be able to do that. What are the actual steps you have to take in order to implement that? Yeah, I think it starts in the offseason. You have to make sure your body's prepared to um, play a game that way. And then in practice, you have to you know constantly cover, constantly finish plays, and just put yourself in the best possible situation. But it really is a mindset. So it was one of those things that I took day by day and just trying to implement into my game. Can you, when a younger guy comes in, can you spot a guy right away who you feel like is going to have a great upwards trajectory in this league? I think so. You see a guy move or the guy, a big thing for me is like recovery because you're going to get beat at times in this league and um, the way they can recover and practice or, or make a move. And I'm like, man, that's pretty impressive stuff. If they can put it together and work at it, like they're, they're going to take the next step. I feel like my record for picking guys who I think are going to be great players is less than, uh, I think I, I might be 100% on guys that I knew for a fact were not going to last at least a season in this league. Do you feel like you can you can spot those guys in any position group pretty easily? Yeah, I think you're right on that fact. The guys that aren't going to make it are a little easier to spot because the O-line play especially takes some time. But um, sometimes you can tell like, all right, this guy just doesn't have the right mindset. He won't make it. It really is such a joy to watch you play and to watch you work. You live up to the reputation of the guys that play around you have spoken about you. And and I wish you nothing but the best, pal, and, and really, really looking forward to watching you guys kick ass. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks for tuning in to Block Forever. I hope you enjoy listening to the show as much as I am making it. Really, really, really grateful to my guest, Sean McDermott, Joel Batonio. These guys were so gracious to give me some time to talk right in the middle of trying to get this season going. If you happen to miss last week's episode, you should check out my conversation with one of my all-time favorite teammates, Christian McCaffrey. We spoke about, among other things, his love-hate relationship with fantasy football. And he also shared a story about the time he got left on a bus in Green Bay. Sounds about right. Quick reminder to tune into Thursday Night Football on Amazon Prime. This week, the Cleveland Browns host the Pittsburgh Steelers. Next week and every Wednesday, make sure to check out a new episode of this very show, Block Forever. Talk to you next week. This has been an Audible original production of Block Forever, produced by Fresh Produce and Audiorama. Matt Waxman is our lead producer. Sound design and edit by Kenny Holmes. 
Our producers are Kenny Holmes and Matt Schrader, production assistant Ben Gerstel, and our talent booker is Kristen Dunn. For Audible, executive producer Pat Shaw. For Audio Rama, the executive producer, well, that's me, Ryan Khalil. For Fresh Produce Media, executive producers Colin Moore, Joe Killian, and Jason Ross. Head of production, Elena Bovitz. Our supervising producer is Jamila Zara Williams. Production coordinator, Henry Koch. And our production manager is Herminio Ochoa. Special thanks to Powerhouse Capital and Mikey Fowler. And I'm your host, Ryan Khalil. Copyright 2022 by Audiorama Inc. Sound recording copyright 2022.